when I see students generally, what I find uh, is that the students are much better prepared with the left hand than they are with the right by sometimes as much as two years. And by that I mean that the technical prowess and uh, sensitivity to movement and so forth is much more developed in the left hand than it is the right. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and as you heard from that opening quote, we are diving deep into bow strokes today. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, and we've covered it extensively over the past decade plus that this podcast has been going on. And I love synthesizing all these interviews into one specific topic like we're doing today. That opening quote was from the great Lawrence Hurst, longtime Indiana University bass professor. And you'll be hearing from many folks throughout this episode, including Matthew McDonald, principal bass of the Berlin Philharmonic, Lloyd Goldstein, who is a longtime Francois Raboth student and former member of the Florida Orchestra, David Allen Moore of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and University of Southern California bass professor, Ed Barker and Lawrence Wolf, both of the Boston Symphony, Michael Hovnanian of the Chicago Symphony, and Ira Gold of the National Symphony and the Peabody Conservatory. And we are breaking this episode into three parts. Part one is an overview of bow strokes in general. Part two is all about spiccato and features Lawrence Wolf and Ed Barker giving some great advice on practicing and developing your spiccato. And part three is a bow stroke deep dive and all about articulations and really defining all these bow strokes that we use on a daily basis. I'd also like to thank Upton Bass String Instrument Company, A440, and the Bass Violin Shop for sponsoring this episode. You'll hear more from them later. So for part one of this episode, we're setting the scene for just developing bow strokes in general. And one of the takeaways I had listening back to these is just how nebulous and challenging it is to practice anything with the bow. Here's a quote from Matthew McDonald about how kind of karate kid wax on, wax off all this sort of stuff can be in terms of the bow. It's a little bit like karate kid, you know, so I don't need to learn karate. No, I don't need to learn how to watch the window. I need to learn karate, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've got an audition in six weeks. I don't want to just, you know, but stuck with it because what do we do? Just let me put my bow on the string and completely relax the arm, completely relax the whole arm and hand and let the weight into the string, and then just move the bow. And if I'd done that, as she'd said to, then the sound was, was awful because it was too much weight. And so then we'd modify it, just going very slowly, so sort of gradually developing a kind of vocabulary of weight and speed. But by now, I kind of, almost as if there's a hundred different positions I love that idea of there being a hundred different positions of arm weight. And it's such a nebulous thing to practice. The bow is. The left hand's so much more objective. It's either first finger, second finger, D string, A string. It's in tune. It's out of tune. You're vibrating. You're not vibrating. You're in this position. You're in that position. Whereas the right arm, like Matthew is describing, it's kind of like painting. The bows are paintbrush and the left hands are calculator. I use that phrase sometimes with my students. I want to play next a clip from Lloyd Goldstein, who's a long time, like I said at the beginning, a long time Francois Raboth student. And Lloyd's talking about the Son Premier, which I'll let him describe it. But this kind of similar takeaways to what Matthew was just talking about. He showed this one simple exercise, you moving the bow down, up, down, and, you know, with these certain movements, a certain way of propelling the, the hand and the wrist and the arm. And I became obsessed with just this one thing. I knew that everything would flow from this one basic movement, that if I could do this one beautiful movement, these three bows, connect three bows flawlessly Mm -hmm. using his approach, I knew that everything would would emanate from that. And it, it actually did. Even with just those two quotes, you can already tell, bowing is a complex thing. Seems simple takes years and years to master. And like Lawrence Hurst said at the beginning, 
most students, when they would walk into his studio at Indiana, they were two years behind in the bow arm than in the left arm. Now, I also chatted with Matthew McDonald about how playing in the Berlin Philharmonic changed the way he thought about bowing in general. Here's that clip. I think before, my concept of bow stroke had been maybe thinking about it from the, the wrist, the fingers, maybe the forearm, and that was about it. And then people kept talking about um, the sound coming from the back and um, almost the full body. So trying, trying to understand that. And then I did a lot of mimicking. I would look in the mirror, trying to, trying to find parts of each player in the section of their bow stroke of, of how they appear and then try and let my body copy it and try and feel what they were feeling. But it, it took a long time, but I think in the end, the biggest thing that helped was just, this was after the academy, but um, a lot of lessons with a viola teacher, Gertrude Rosbacher, and basically just the principle of starting a note. We spent a month on that, twice a week, just basically starting a note, relaxing the arm and starting the note. And then I found once I had that under control, then it was, it was a lot easier to get through the whole bow with constant contact and a constant sound, which is, you know, so important for legato. But anyway, just to get, just to get those, those huge strings on that huge instrument swinging at all, it's just so much kind of pulling and giving the balance of weight and pull. Also, it's a lot of it's a lot of rosin as well. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, it's a lot of rosin. You're going to hear Ed Barker echo that lot of rosin sentiment later, and that's something that always amazes me when I'm working with students is they're trying like heck to get this thing, and then I play their bow and I say, "Can I see your cake of pops?" I use pops typically, and I put like four swipes of pops, give them the bow back, and all of a sudden everything works. So if you're struggling with your bow strokes, folks, public service announcement. Put on a couple swipes of rosin and see what happens. And to finish off this first part, I've got a great quote from David Allen Moore. This is from my first interview with him, which was back in 2008 or something like that. And he's talking about how actually there are differences between French bow and German bow. We like to pretend that there aren't, but there are, and especially in the way you approach the string. And by the way, side note, David plays these really cool, I think Boris Fritsch is the name of the bow maker, bows that can be held both German and French style. So he's had a lot of experience on both bows and has thought a lot about this. Here's the clip from David. I think just like in a lot of, of culture, there's, there's an effort to say like, you know, oh, everything's the same and we're all the same and it's all exactly the same and you know, kind of wanting to have this sort of PC notion of, of a one world Boeing concept. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you have to acknowledge that there, the mechanics are different and the strengths and weaknesses are different. And the, the simple fact of the matter is that, you know, everyone is driven by their aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So if you have a certain sound in mind, you're going to sound that way regardless of what gear you're playing. So it's not like just the bow in and of itself is going to make a difference between whether a person sounds one way or another way, because it's ultimately driven by, by your voice and your aesthetic and how you want to sound. But um, there are fundamental differences to how you address the string and how you approach the string and sort of the, um, the qualities that that, that that brings to your sound sort of inherently in that approach. I mean, it, there are certain sounds that I get with the, the French bow that I'm, I'm just struggling to get with the German bow, but because they're not as native or natural, I can get them once I've experienced them, but they wouldn't be things that I would have found maybe on my own without playing them overhand and vice versa. Okay, that's part one of this episode, which is setting the scene for digging deep into bow strokes. And yes, by the way, in case you're wondering, I do see the irony of playing these pizzicato Ruben Rogers loops uh, in a bow strokes episode, but it's just what's handy on my desktop. So sorry about that. <laughs> but I would like to thank our sponsor, Upton Bass String Instrument Company. And I've been a fan of Upton for years and years and years, had many students 
buy Upton basses. I've had so many colleagues play Upton basses. I just totally love what they're doing. And I want to talk to you just a bit about their Bohemian model, which is essentially the simple gamba outline that they started with when they moved into the barn in 2012 up in Mystic, Connecticut and kind of overhauled everything. So Upton had one of the best looking Jusex that they'd ever seen. And to them, it was the epitome of what a bohemian styled bass should be. It was so close to the simple gamba, but it was much more elegant. And Upton, they just had to copy it. So everything about the bohemian is meant to fit in. It's as close to what a three quarter size bass should be in today's marketplace. Not too big, not too small. It is the Goldilocks bass. It's just right. I've got a link in the show notes so you can check out more about their bohemian model. And thank you, Upton, for sponsoring the podcast. And I'd also like to thank A440 Violin Shop, which is in Chicago, Illinois, just down the street from Wrigley Field, in the wonderful Roscoe Village neighborhood. Love that neighborhood. And A440 does it all. They do sales, they do repairs, they do rentals. I've had my bases worked on, I think three or four of my own bases over the years, worked on by the fine folks at A440. I've sent countless students to A440. They do great work. If you're passing through town and you need a base for a few days in Chicago, get in touch with A440. They're at a440violinshop.com. Okay, for part two, we're digging deeper into both strokes. And the second part is all about spiccato and how to develop your off the string strokes. We're starting with this great how to excerpt from Ed Barker. And big shout out to my longtime colleague and co host, John Grillo. He and I interviewed Ed. This is years ago at this point, but just wonderful content. You're going to be hearing a lot of Ed the rest of this episode. The first thing that's really important is uh, is getting a sense of the springiness of the bow, and uh, what and realizing that that in most instances uh, spiccato tends to be a thrown bow stroke, uh, and therefore uh, you need to get a feel for just uh, sort of throwing the bow on this on the string in a in a slightly controlled way, but just letting the bow. Bounce. So, so uh, what I often do is I suggest that students uh, hold the stick with a very relaxed grip. That they that they let the bow essentially uh, from a from a from a a little bit of an altitude above the string. That they just let the bow sort of easily drop onto the string, and with and at the same time do just a slight down bow motion and let the bow uh, springy, springy, spring and bounce on, on the note. It could be an open note, like an open D, for example. Uh, and just just drop it onto the string. And as, it's, as you're dropping it, just draw the bow down bow slightly and let it bounce. Uh, and, and again, the key is letting it bounce, not making it bounce. Therefore, you have to have a fairly relaxed right hand. Uh, and then... Once you're comfortable doing that on a on a down bow on the D string, then do it on an up bow on the A string. And again, you kind of just very lightly and gently throw the bow on the string, let the bow bounce, so it gives a a kind of a uh, I don't know what it would be called if it's a, it's not a sautier, it's a um, it's a um, jeté, it's like a jeté. You know that term? Um, I think I may have heard it, but what is that? Yeah, mean? I mean, jeté is, yeah, I mean, a jeté is a, uh, it's, a it's, it's exactly that. It's a thrown bow stroke where you just let the bow kind of bounce oh, on, in one direction. You know what I mean? Right, right. And so, so you do it on a down bow, and then you do it on an up, on the D string and an up bow on the A string, and you just let it bounce. And then after you become comfortable with that, you then, uh, uh, do the same thing, but as you recall earlier, I mentioned that a spiccato is a thrown bow stroke where you let the bow bounce rather than make it bounce. But it's a controlled bounce. That's the key. It's controlled. So so now what we're going to do is we're going to start to control it. And we do that by, instead of letting it bounce as in a jeté on a down bow on the D string, you just let it bounce once. So you throw it onto the string, let the bow hit it, and bounce up, and then and then that's it. And you do that a few times, and then you you do it on the A string on an up bow. You throw it on, let it bounce once, and just uh, leave it at that. And you get comfortable doing that. 
and eventually the next step is to uh is to uh is to uh do it once on the d string on a down bow and then once on the a string on an up bow so that you have uh down up down up all the way all the while kind of letting the bow drop onto the string and bounce back up and you're just controlling it and always down on the d up on the a so you're letting it bounce and then as you get good with that you 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 control the bounce a little more by letting the bounce become a little closer to the string and again always down on the d up on the a down on the d up on the a and then uh as you get good at that you start going a little faster so it's down on the d up on the a so it's yum pom 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 and so on and so forth and as you get faster and more controlled you start to develop a controlled um, thrown bow stroke with the idea that the down bow is always approached from the slightly above the string and the up bow is always approached from slightly below the string. That That's exemplified by the move D on the down, A on the up. And then after you you get reasonably comfortable with that, you do it on one string. And it could be an open string or any one note anywhere. And you're always approaching the down bow from slightly above the, the string, above meaning the G side of the of, of a given string, and you always approach the up bow from slightly below that string, meaning the A side, if we're talking about the D string, for example, the, the A side of that string. And um, and so what happens is you, you start to be able to control that a little bit with your with your wrist and the the hand and wrist start to make a, a slight up and down uh, motion. We're turning the mic over to Lawrence Wolf, also of the Boston Symphony, and his thoughts and recommendations for developing a good spiccato. In my particular case, um, if you just stay on the string, but it, but you're in a part of the bow, a sweet spot, of, sweet spot of the bow, the bow will lift, mm-hmm. no matter where you are. I mean, no, no matter. I mean, well, the bow will lift at appropriate speeds, mm-hmm. and I just tap into. I try to tap into that. The length of the note that the listener hears is uh, directly related to the length of bow that is drawn across the string. It's simply, um, it's not the stroke. It, but before anything else, the length, of, the length of note required by the music and by the player is going to be determined by the amount of lateral motion of the bow across the string. And so, therefore, a shorter note requires less motion. Of course, there are strokes attached to that motion, Or, but some, sometimes I've discovered some students go... <laughs> They, they they look at that and say it must be spiccato, and so they assign a stroke to it before they assign a length of note per a length of bow per note to it. Mm-hmm. And I've discovered that when if, there's a reward if you, if I if I really going honestly pursuing that honestly and say okay how much bow do I actually need for each one of those notes and for that aforementioned let's say the six eight fugue in in the last one of Beethoven ninth you know the the march part um, um the street march that. Actually, it could be no more than half an inch of bow that that is physically required to play the the, the length of note that the context requires, mm-hmm. and then so by just by keeping the bow on the string in a sweet spot, knowing that you're drawing it just back and forth half an inch at a time, I discover that by doing that, the bow lifts for me, mm-hmm. and and then then the bow lifts, and and then it's a naturally based the, the spiccato is based on the natural tension of the bow and, and of the string, the staccato that, well, I just go for the sound first and the stroke almost invents itself. Going back to Ed Barker for a moment, Ed discusses when to be off and when to be on the string and how you probably need to be able to play certain passages both off and on the string. And Ed is talking about, in this particular excerpt, Mozart's 35th Symphony, the Hafner Symphony. There's often a discussion in the uh, about the last movement of the um, Mozart Hofner Symphony, Symphony Number no. Thirty Five, uh, and as to whether the the eighth note passages in the Hofner Symphony should be played on the string or off the string. All right. Now it's my it's my uh, contention that that a good player, uh, meaning a sophisticated player who has uh, you know really fine technique. Uh, should be able to do it either way, either on or off. Oftentimes, it's our job in the orchestra to, if the conductor would ask for it on the string, we have to be able to do it. 
If he asks for it off, we have to be able to do that. Um, what I found, what I found is that uh, depending on the tempo of those of of the last movement, uh, determines whether um, the bow stroke is on or or off. Um, people often ask me, well, should it be on or should it be off? And I, my answer is, well, it is not on the string, but it is not off the string either. Um, and so, so the the point being that at a slower tempo, those spiccatos, those could be uh, those uh, notes could be played at a spiccato, but the spiccato is a, is a much more horizontal and and brushy kind of spiccato. Uh, at a faster tempo, and we've done it um, at tempos as fast as uh, as one uh, half note equals. Um, uh, 160, uh, and where the conductor conducts it in one. And what I found is that at a fast tempo, it's necessary to play those spiccatos a little more off the string and shorter, uh, especially in our concert hall here in Boston. And um, so, so there's an example, for instance, with a spiccato where you actually you actually do have to consider all three parts of the note, um, uh, whether it's a shorter, uh, faster. Uh, sort of slightly spikier sound, or if it's the tempo is slightly slower, still fast, but slightly slower, um, and a slightly more brushed concept, or the kind of thing where the bow stays, sort of the hair stays principally in contact with the string, but the stick bounces. Um, uh, and so that, in that sense, yes, there is a, there is a concept uh, about that, although I wouldn't want to make too much of that. Um, it has, it has to do with the overall, um, uh, the overall effect that, that you're trying to, trying to get. Um, so sometimes you have to think larger groups of notes rather than individual notes at, at really, at these really fast tempos. Some great advice for developing off the string strokes from two masters of the instrument. And going into part three, part three, we're starting off with a few chunks with Ed Barker describing just how articulations relate to articulations in speech, like what I'm doing right now, talking to you. And then Ed going through and defining really what every on and off the string general bow stroke category is and the physical motions this is totally amazing content you're going to love it and before we dive into part three i'd like to give a shout out to our final sponsor the bass violin shop and here's what john fogelman says about his experience with the bass violin shop i quote at the bass violin shop you get the quality your bass deserves it's always a pleasure to meet bob tony sanders cody they know what your bass needs to look and perform at its best they have taken all my k and american standard basses to another level of great tone playability i highly recommend that you inquire about their services you can read more reviews of the bass violin shop on their website at bassviolinshop.com and there are even more reviews and testimonials on their Facebook page. And check out the show notes for a link to both of those. Okay, here's part three. And we're starting off with Ed Barker describing the relationship of articulations on the bass to vocal articulations. A lot of what we do in, in music, uh, especially on string instruments, but I think all instruments, you know, basically is uh, they... The, the, it's an attempt to emulate the voice to to create a singing a singing concept uh, by way of the instrument. And uh, music, uh, it needs to be understood that music is a language, just like uh, any spoken language. And in fact, there are many many analogies between music and language, not the least of which is the con the singing concept. And so, our, the articulations are are based on an analysis of, of how to phrase things in, in a, in a, in a style that, that, uh, that it's rather similar to the way we would speak. I mean, for instance, just as an example, if you listen to or read, read any paragraph, if you speak any paragraph in the English language or any language for that matter, um, and listen to it, you'll, you'll hear that there are going to be a series of pauses. There's a lot of breathing. There is movement, there is uh, repose at the end of sentences. There are various articulations, uh, different kinds of consonants, 
uh, and there are softer articulations which are more vowel-like. And uh, all of these kinds of things make um, language really um, colorful and interesting and also understandable. And that's what that's that's the exact parallel in terms of playing the instrument. Okay, here it is. Bookmark this, folks. Write this down. 25 minutes into this episode, this is Ed Barker's famous description of on the string and off the string articulations. Here we go. In my schooling of bass, there are a lot of uh, bass playing. There are a lot of uh, articulations that that sort of follow a continuum from very vowel-like and soft and connected uh, gestures to very short staccato and uh, consonant gestures uh, and and uh, uh, sounds. And so uh, the on, uh, some of these. Uh, are played on the string and some of them are played off. The on the string articulations are articulations like uh, legato, marcato, uh, par, uh, portato, uh, some aspects of the detache, and uh, a lot of the accented um, gestures. So if you went from a continuum from, from longest to shortest on the string, in my schooling of playing, the, the longest and the most connected is the legato, and uh, basically that's a bow stroke where you, you you draw the bow back and forth or up and down, up up bow and down bow, and uh, the attempt is to make a very very clean and non audible bow change. Uh, I suppose uh, legato also technically would be a series of notes under a slur. Uh, on the double bass, we have to try to develop a very, very uh, good legato bow stroke where we actually have to change bows. So you could have a series of notes under a slur, but but because our bows tend to be shorter and our strings longer, it's often necessary for us to change bow uh, under a legato slur. So it's very important to have a, a bow change that is uh, very, very clean. And the legato bow stroke is... Um, the, the essential way to, to do it, although much easier said than done, is to change bows at, when you change from a down bow, up bow, or other way around, is to change bows at the same speed and pressure uh, that, uh, that you're, that you're uh, moving at. Um, now, the, the inclination and it seems to be, I don't know, it's sort of a physical and neurological uh, inclination that everyone has is to actually kick the bow change so that when we change the bow, we actually speed up the bow. And that puts a little bit of a kick into the, into the change and that, that disrupts the legato. So, so the discipline is learning to draw a bow that is, uh, that feels as if you're slowing down when you change the bow. And actually what you're doing is you're just negating the kick by, by having a very, very slow bow change. And that's an important thing to know how to do because uh, it, because our strings are so thick, it's often necessary for us to engage the string very slowly, even from a dead start on the string. If we don't engage slowly, then what happens is the the string will not speak immediately, and therefore uh, you'll get a, a an ex, what I would refer to as an extraneous noise or a non-musical sound. Um, in other words, you get a um, a scratch, and so so the legato bow stroke is really important to learn how to do. Uh, and then we work our way on a continuum from there into a a detached, slightly detached bow stroke. I would call this an on the string detaché, or sometimes I call it a a um, sustained detaché. And this is where again we we uh, draw the bow. Uh, we stop the bow, then we start the bow again in the next direction, and we do that uh, while engaging the string uh, again slightly on the slow side, so so that it makes for a clean break in between the uh, bow changes, but not having a consonant attack on the bow on the bow change. Um, and a consonant attack would be anything that creates like a uh, like a pinched sound on the string, you know, like a ka or a ta or a da. So that, so that the next, uh, as I was said before, the the continuum from legato to sustained detaché is still a non 
a non-consonant attack concept. Um, later on, we learned to add consonants to both strokes, um, and we could talk about that in a minute. But as a matter of fact, we'll talk about it right now. So uh, the next the next idea would be a marcato, and in a marcato, the sound the music musical sound begins rather abruptly. Um, and, uh, there is a, there is a very, uh, audible, um, marked attack. I call it a consonant attack at the beginning, uh, of the bow stroke. Um, you could liken that to either a, a like a T or a, even a, a, um, a, a B, a B pronounced very, very clearly like boy or toy rather than, um, wall, for example. Um, Yes, yeah, the difference between ball and wall. Um, and a marcato, um, it's often, uh, those marcato notes are, um, slightly, uh, separated from one another. Uh, though in my schooling of playing, not necessarily. You can actually have a sustained bow, bow sound, uh, and the bow changes have a marked attack at the beginning. Those are still marcados in a sense. And then uh, the next in terms of, uh, let me see, we're still on the string, aren't we? So so another uh, bow stroke that would be on the string would be a portato, which actually sounds rather like a detache. And, uh, but instead of changing the bow like you do on a detache, you, you simply connect the uh, uh, a series of notes on one bow stroke uh, with a slight uh, um, sort of releasing of the pressure. Um, and a slight slowing down of the bow without actually taking the bow off the string, and that that's a portato. So if you had a uh, uh, if you were to use a word to describe what a portato might sound like, instead of um, uh, marcato, which might which might be something like ta ta ta, with each gesture starting with a t, uh, a portato would be more like wa wa wa, with each gesture starting with a w. Um, now that said, uh, uh, the detaché. I want to go back to the detaché bow stroke for a second. There are lots of different kinds of detaché. There are on the string detaché. Some notes are slightly more detached than the other. Others, uh, some notes, some some kinds of detachés. You are uh, sort of having a very uh, rather legato bow change, but you sort of push the beginning of each note like there's a quasi accent on each note. That forms a kind of détaché. But the one kind of détaché that is fairly unique to this school of bass playing is uh, what what my teacher always used to refer to simply as as the détaché. But I've, I've taken to calling it a carried détaché. Uh, and that's a bow stroke that is an, essentially an off-the-string bow stroke. And I define off-the-string as uh, being a bow stroke where the movement for the for the bow stroke starts in the air uh, not from the string and so with this 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 carry detaché is essentially um a um uh it's like an airplane landing and taking off basically and uh uh it's a glorified uh <laughs> i often refer to it as a glorified brush stroke but it is rather different than your just a standard brush stroke. Um, but this detaché, when the bow uh, starts, bow movement starts in the air, uh, and then it makes contact with the string, there is little or no change in the bow speed. Uh, again, it's very similar to when an airplane lands or uh, takes off, if, if the airplane does a really smooth landing. Um, most people, when they do a, a um, brush stroke, tend to slow the bow down significantly when, when the bow makes contact with the string. And that produces a very different kind of sound, one that is actually much more uh, detached uh, or separate than, than, than this carried detaché, which uh, I define as being the, the bow stroke that is the next closest thing to a legato sound. But... What happens is when the bow is carried and then uh, it, it, it makes contact with the string, the note is drawn for a duration, then the bow leaves the string, we change bows in the air and then make contact again with the string and so on and so forth. During the bow change, when the bow is in the air, 
the, uh, the string continues to vibrate. So there's not an actual stop in sound. Therefore, uh, uh, there's a certain resonance that carries through. And this, uh, this way of playing, actually, this sound is rather similar to a portato that I was defining before. I remember, as I said before, the portato is an on-the-string bow stroke where you play a series of notes on, over under one uh, long bow. And you uh, slightly vary the pressure and speed of the bow so that you, pre- you produce a sound that sounds something like wah, 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 wah. A détaché, a carried détaché, uh, the sound is like da, 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 so that the, the length of the note is rather similar to the portato, but the articulation is slightly more consonant. And, uh, uh, therefore you have another, um, uh, uh, bow stroke in your arsenal to be able to help with, with phrasing. So those those are essentially the I think the on the string bow strokes. Uh, we have started now be getting off the string with this carried détaché. Um, if you were to shorten that carried détaché rather radically, uh, you would start to enter the area of of what we call the spiccato, which is really more of a technique than an actual articulation. It's an it's a bounce a thrown bow stroke or an off the string stroke and spiccatos of course can be manipulated so they're they're rather short the, the sound of the note is rather short or can be a little longer and slightly brushier depending on what you what you want to do musically um, but spiccato is a thrown bow stroke and essentially it's the kind of thing where you have to rely on the natural springiness of the bow and the hair uh, the tightened hair on the bow and, uh, and the, the rebound when the bow strikes the string, it tends to bounce, bounce up. And, and so that's why we call it a, a, an off the string or a bounced bow stroke. And it's a thrown bow stroke and you're kind of letting the bow bounce, uh, which is different than making the bow bounce. And, uh, you're letting it bounce and you're, you're, you're controlling the rate of the bounce. Uh, and uh, that's essentially what a spiccato is. And that is rather different from uh, the martelet, which in my schooling of playing is usually an off-the-string articulation. Uh, it's, 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 uh, I, refer to as, as a, I refer to it as a hammered bow stroke. And uh, it's a hard attack, rather sharp attack, and it's produced by um, uh, striking the string really hard. Um, and then uh, pulling pulling back very very quickly uh, with a lot of energy, so that so that this is an off the string articulation where you're actually making the bow bounce rather than letting it bounce. And uh, in doing so, it produces a very sh- hard, sharp, uh, slightly brittle attack. It's rather it's actually rather similar to a a. It's actually easier to demonstrate than it is to talk about, but but a, a, a pizzicato where where uh, you grab the string very quickly with the finger being in in the in the air and you grab it and then you pull away very quickly. Uh, essentially, that's what we do with the bow. Um, and so so uh, in my schooling of playing, in order to do some of these articulations like martelet, um, marcato, and stuff, to do this effectively it's necessary to use a fair amount of rosin in the orchestral setting, especially um, so that we get a lot of grip on the string and we are able to uh, produce a lot of uh, consonants as well as vowel type sounds. And in my school of playing by using a a lot of rosin, uh, uh, therefore you have to find a way to manipulate the bow on the string without um, uh, sounding too rosiny uh, without the bow getting stuck because you have too much rosin, et cetera. And uh, the way to do that is by carrying the bow rather than dragging the bow across the string. And that's uh, my schooling of playing. That's, that's what we do. We carry it, and it's um, I carry it from the shoulder, basically. So we use a, a lot of the, the whole arm in the bow strokes. And uh, in, in my particular in case, it's a, uh, the way I play, and I think a number of people 
in this in Boston. It's a fairly straight arm way of playing, rather than a bent loose arm. It's fairly straight. Most most articulations are controlled from the shoulder. There's that reference to Rosin again, just like Matthew McDonald was talking about. And Ed goes on, this is a little bit later from the same interview, to talk about accents and to talk about notes having a beginning, middle, and end. You will love this as well. In terms of articulations, let me just define a couple of other, of other things, the way I like to approach. Uh, that has to do with accents. Um, an accent uh, on a note, I mean, there are a lot of ways to accent a note, and it's, it, this being what we do as an art form, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, judgment involved in, in how we create uh, articulations and accents. But an accent, the way I look at it, is essentially energy at the beginning of the note. Uh, if you have a note, and let's, let's assume that every note has three parts to it which is a beginning, as you said, and a middle, and an end to that note. An accent creates, makes the note stand out in relief uh, compared to the other notes around it. And it is done by giving more energy to the beginning part of that note. All right? And what has to happen then is when, when we accent is that there has to be a release of that energy either in the middle of that note or at the end of the note, all right? If there is no release of the energy, then what you have, and there's energy all through all three parts of the note, then what you have is not an accent. You simply have a loud note. And that's a little different than, than an accent. So, so basically, an accent creates contrast, not only separating that note from the notes around it, but it creates contrast within the note itself. There has to be a difference between the way you attack the note and the way you, the way you end the note. And it has to do with the amount of energy. Uh, is, that, is that clear? I mean, is that understandable? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and so, so that's what accents are. Um, and, and this is why it's important to know how you're going to treat uh, these three parts of notes, not just for accents, but for articulations as well. Um, the, the important thing to remember is this. That, that when I, most, uh, conscientious players, I'm, I'm talking about student, student level players, uh, all think about how they treat the beginnings of notes. Um, that's what they're taught to do and they're trained to do that. The ones that are a little more sophisticated think about how they treat the middle of the note and, and it's the way they sustain the note. Um, and, um, but it's only the most, um, most mature and sophisticated players that, that understand how to treat the end of the note and how the end of that note relates to the beginning of the next note. Uh, and then, of course, the process starts all over. Uh, this is how you, this is how you f- uh, begin to understand how to, f- how, to, how to phrase. This has to do with um, uh, the application of technique to musical phrasing. And, of course, as we all know, uh, the only reason for an exceptional technique is to accommodate sophisticated phrasing concepts. I want to key in on that last thing that Ed said again. Listen to that one more time. The only reason for an exceptional technique is to accommodate sophisticated phrasing concepts. And I think that just so clearly drives home the why. Why do we want to develop these strokes? It's all about being able to express more with the music, make more interesting phrases, more sophisticated, like Ed says, phrasing concepts. Beautiful. I really hope you've enjoyed this so far. And I have a little bit more for you because you've got all this great information. Now, how the heck do you develop these strokes, right? And I've got a few specific takeaways for you. The first thing we're going to dive into is the Sevchik School of Bowing Technique, which is something that my teacher, Michael Hovnanian, used all the time. Here's a clip of Michael Hovnanian, Chicago Symphony bassist, Michael Hovnanian, talking about how he used Sevchik to develop his own bowing technique. And apologies, I know it sounds like Michael's underwater. My live microphone techniques left something to be desired in the early days, but you'll understand him. Yeah, I also at that time got like those Seb Chick books, and I had, my sister, you know, was a violinist, so I had, I swiped all her old books when she quit playing, um, and I would just go through like scales and bowing patterns, so my practice routine was really... In between auditions, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on the excerpts. Like if there was no audition for three months, I wouldn't even bother trying to play through Mozart 35 until like maybe a month 
before or something, I would figure, okay, I got to work on my spiccato or I got to work on the sustained sound or you know something, and then I would do it with scales, um, scales and bowing patterns. What I've used in recent years, and many of you have probably heard of this, some of you maybe not, is Hal Robinson's wonderful book, Stroken, which is the Sevchik Opus 2, what Michael was talking about, the Opus 2 School of Bowing Technique, written for violin you know, by Sevchik, but it works so wonderfully for bass, and it's been adapted several times, but Hal's adaptation is just the most marvelous in terms of tempos, in terms of, I don't know, you name it, layout. The two and three string etudes he created are so awesome. It's just such a great technical resource. In fact, when I have more advanced students come and work with me, I tell them to buy two books. One is Boardwalking, which is a specific left-hand element of the Raboth technique, more or less. And the other book is Stroken. Now, I'm going to finish off with this clip from Ira Gold, and Ira has actually been doing an orchestral bowing workshop. He's been doing this. This is his second year coming up. He's actually having Dennis Whitaker, former podcast guest, Dennis Whitaker teaching as well this year, and Ira got this idea in part from watching Hal Robinson do bow strokes workshop. So here's Ira describing his workshop and what he does. And again, highly, highly recommend you check out Stroken from Hal Robinson. And there is a link in the show notes to pick that up. If everyone in the room is hearing each other playing the same strokes and then trying to apply it to a certain excerpt, it just resonates more with what everyone is supposed to be trying to go towards. So that's just kind of what the seed that planted in my mind. Um, so a couple of years ago, I started doing this. I just kind of came up with this idea. Of, okay, I'm going to write down what all the bow strokes are. I'm going to write down the definitions. And then I went to the next point, which I'm going to write down. I'm going to draw some visual shapes that go with that definition. Okay, now I'm going to add um, an explanation of what body parts and um, joints and muscles are being used when you do such a bow stroke. Okay, now I'm going to write down what it should feel like and what words you can use to describe what the feeling is of doing that bow stroke. So now I have this handout that sort of evolved over the last two or three years that includes all this information. And when I've gone to different colleges, and we've done it also at the T Valley Base Works camp in the summer, um, you know, I, I hand out this sheet, which again, the handout is not really important. It's just one, it's like a brochure. It's like, mm -hmm. here's what we're exploring. I mean, the real experience is what happens in the room when we hear people play their instruments and we work on the strokes. So the idea is really kind of three things. The first part is being able to play certain strokes on an open string or a scale. And the second part is understanding all of the things that I've written down on the and uh, And then the third part is incorporating it into music. All right, there you have it, folks. I hope this was useful, this dive into the topic of bow strokes. Whenever I put one of these highlight episodes together, at first I think, have I covered that topic? Eh, maybe once or twice. And then I really start to go back in the archives and I realize with some of these topics like bow strokes, yes, I have covered it extensively. I've got many more of these coming up. In fact, the next episode coming out is going to be one on posture or more specifically standing and sitting. I think I'll probably call it standing versus sitting just to get people's attention, but it's not a versus, of course. If you enjoy these highlight episodes, I put together a bunch of them and you can find them all at ContraBaseConversations.com slash highlights. I've done episodes on auditioning, of course, that ended up becoming my book, Winning the Audition. I've done one recently on practicing techniques, bass and the body, jazz legends giving advice on the business of music. I've got a whole heap of others coming up in the future. And I hope you enjoy these. I've heard great feedback from people about these. So I know that many really do enjoy these. If you have any topics you'd like me to cover, and it doesn't have to be a highlight episode like this, any specific topics you'd like me to cover with guests or with a panel of guests, I'm always thinking about new 
ideas and new ways to explore this medium. I love the podcasting medium. I think it's such a useful, flexible way to connect with people. I listen to podcasts all day long while I'm not <laughs> recording my own podcast. As soon as I'm done with this, I'm going down to the gym and I'll listen to a few podcasts I've been looking forward to. So I love delivering content like this and I'd love to know your thoughts. Send me a message, feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. And as always, you want to help out the show, best thing you can do is share this episode. Share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, email it to a friend. It does not have to be a bass player. Obviously, these bow stroke concepts, well, some of the things we talked about are somewhat bass specific. Most of it's not, right? All that wonderful discussion from Ed Barker. Anybody would benefit from that. String player, obviously, but not string players as well. So share this out. I would appreciate that so much. I know you're going to dig this next episode on posture, which is, by the way, recommended by a listener. That's how I get my ideas these days. Fred Zimmerman recommended the posture idea, and not Fred Zimmerman of New York Philharmonic, but uh, another Fred Zimmerman. So thank you, Fred. And if you have a recommendation for something like what I did today or like what I was just talking about, let me know. I'd love to hear from you, and I will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>